Welcome to Successful Philanthropy. I'm your host, Jean Shafaroff. This show is designed to highlight the work of philanthropic leaders here in the United States and then beyond. Today with us, a fascinating couple, Stuart Lane and his lovely wife, Bonnie Cumley. Stuart Lane and Bonnie Cumley are both Broadway producers, they're philanthropists, and they're the founders of Broadway HD. Let's all welcome Bonnie Cumley and Stuart Lane. And Bonnie and Stuart, so great to have you here on the show. And I want to start with your beginnings. Uh, Stuart and Bonnie, how did you originally get involved as producers in, on Broadway? Oh, well. Very different uh, stories. Stu's is more interesting, right. so uh, I always defer to him. Well, I, I'm one of those individuals who fell in love with the theater at an early age. So from like uh, 10 years old and on, I wanted to be part of the theater community. Uh, I saw my first Broadway show, which had starred my, my best friend's father in it, Sid Caesar. And to see him do Little Me with music by Cy Coleman and the book by Neil Simon uh, live on stage, my first Broadway show, overwhelming. And then going backstage afterwards, seeing him with the camaraderie and friendship, I said, storytelling like this is what I want to do with my life. So that kind of opened up the door for me to major you know, in high school, all the clubs, the drama clubs. I majored in uh, theater at Boston University College of Fine Arts. Uh, and then after several years, felt that I wanted to have at least the illusion of some control over my life, uh, other than being an actor. So I saw a segue into producing. And so in the late 70s and early 80s, I started to produce shows. One of the first ones I did was Whose Life Is It Anyway? You know, it was a show, a uh, play from, based on a BBC a teleplay that, that was transferred from London. Uh, and from then, uh, I went on to do a few, I'll give you the, the successful ones, not the ones that weren't. So we did like Woman of the Year with Lauren Bacall, uh, the original La Cajol Foal, went on to do the Will Rogers Follies and Thoroughly Modern Millie and, and a lot of other shows and kind of went into the producing field at a time when other people really weren't into producing. You know, Broadway was in the trough in the 70s and really blossomed every decade after that. And Bonnie, what about you? How did you get involved? And I understand you've actually won three Tonys for your productions. Yes, thank you. Yes, and Stu actually has six Tonys, and that's so far. We're still uh, we're still <laughs> working on it all the time. Um, but yes, my uh, entry into um, theater is a lot different. I never saw a Broadway show until I was an adult. I was actually a reporter. Um, covering entertainment in New York City. So that was the first time that I went to a Broadway show um, and, you know, thought this was amazing and, you know, more people should see this. And that was always sort of the, the, the back of my, um, my idea for uh, Broadway, what Broadway HD is that we launched six years ago. So that idea of bringing Broadway to people that can't get to the theater. Yes. And speaking of Broadway HD, I understand the two of you founded it in 2015, long before the pandemic ever began. And I know that the Met Opera also started a, a Opera HD a number of years ago, but how did you get involved in that? And when you think about it, what genius, here you were years ahead of this horrific <laughs> pandemic, and you created something that would bring Broadway to everyone around the world. And during the pandemic, obviously we needed um, Broadway HD more than ever. Yes, well, I think that, you know, as I said, I wasn't somebody who grew up going to the theater. And when I finally did see a Broadway show, I thought it was amazing and that this was something that, you know, should be seen by a broader audience. But there are barriers to entry. Some people just can't get to New York City. Some people can't afford $125 for a ticket. And some people have other, you know, limitations that they can't get to New York City or they're not comfortable in the theater. Um, so that was always a way for us to look at it. And we originally were doing what we call one-off which is shooting shows that we knew were either closing or that we had, uh, we were involved in the stage production. But then about eight years ago, uh, we said, you know, looked at each other and said, we'd done about 10 of these, what we call digital captures. Um, and just to be clear, a digital capture is different than a Hollywood adaptation. So nowadays uh, to talk uh, and describe 
Hamilton. And most people, I think, at this point have seen Hamilton on Disney+. Plus. That going into the theater with cameras while the audience is there and capturing what's on the on the stage. That's a digital capture or known as a live capture. And a Hollywood adaptation is very different. Um, the digital capture is basically done in real time. So a two hour show is gonna be seen and, and shot in two hours. Um, again, we do multiple evenings and then edit them together, but it's basically being done in real time. Whereas a Hollywood movie will probably take, you know, three months to shoot, another three months to edit and put it together. Um, and a Hamilton, you know, equivalent is in the Heights. So Hamilton is a digital capture and Lin-Manuel Miranda's In the Heights Hollywood adaptation is the movie version of that. So we were able to put all of these digital captures that we had uh, shot over the years, which at that point we had about 10 of them, uh, but 10 does not make a destination for a subscription streaming service. So we went out and we started aggregating all the content that we could find onto one place, onto one platform, onto Broadway HD. And I think that that's the legacy that we leave behind is aggregating all this similar content into one place. Because prior to that, we didn't invent the idea of going into a theater with cameras. You know, the BBC had been doing that for years. PBS has been doing that for about 50 years. But what we did was put all of them into one place. So if you want to watch theater on a screen, Broadway HD is the destination. Yeah, the question was, where's the business? Where's the business where it's operating? Because as Bonnie said, the BBC and PBS are both nonprofit organizations. We wanted to know if there was a business there. And over the decades, people have been trying to find that platform, that, that audience, or whether it was the DVD market or, or alternative content in cinema, or whether it was pay-per-view on cable. You know, was there enough of a critical mass of people to support an industry that wants to see live captured theater in real time when and where they want it. And to the now, now, I assume it's been very successful. Talk about the success of this venture. Well, we're, we're over six years old now. We have over 350 full-length stage plays and musicals. We add new content every single month. Um, during the pandemic. I mean, we don't want to make a light or dis, you know, be dismissive of the pandemic. Um, definitely had a surge in subscribers during the pandemic, but so did Netflix and Amazon Prime and everybody else that had a streaming service because there wasn't a lot of other activities that we could engage in but streaming. So our service, like everybody else, so but, um, but, you know, when, when Broadway shut down, there was 100,000 workers just in the Broadway space that were unemployed, um, and many of them are still unemployed. So we don't ever meet, being, mean to be dismissive of that. And Broadway HD, our place within the Broadway ecosphere is we're a streaming service like a Netflix. So have the added responsibility and honor to be a service business to the Broadway industry. And what that means is that we're here to support the live business and to drive people to the live experience and to have people buy tickets to Broadway shows, to in-person Broadway shows. So that's really the reason why we put Broadway HD together was to, you know, to increase the fan base for Broadway. Because in a, in, a, in a year before the pandemic, you know, you would have seven, you know, we have 350 million people in the United States. 75% of those 350 million in a, in a regular year would go to the movie theater to watch at least one movie. Whereas pre-pandemic with of the 350 million, only 15% would go to see a live theater experience. So, you know, we're constantly with the digital trying to increase the fan base. And that's never been more important than right now because Broadway tickets pre-pandemic 60% of the tickets were sold to people that live outside of New York City. So until we get the tourists, all the tourists back, you know, we, we're looking at how do we fill that 60% of the theater, of the Broadway theater, because only 40% that are in the tri-state area are the ones that were traditionally ticket buyers. But the digital we're finding really does expand the, the fan base. Yes, and I think it brings the theater to um, tens of thousands of people, if not hundreds of thousands of people who might never be able to experience a Broadway show because they simply can't get to New York or they can't get to a, 
a, a theater, a traveling a theater a showy either because maybe they can't afford it. Now let's go back to the pandemic and the effects of the pandemic on the Broadway community, on all the actors, on all those that work behind the scenes. Everything I've read in the New York Times and in other publications indicate that the uh, Broadway was really hard hit and all those that were employed by Broadway have been very, very hard hit because of the pandemic. What are people doing about this? And, and do you think Broadway is going to open up, they say, this September? Do you think it's going to be successful? Can you shed a little bit of light on all of this for our viewers? Well, it took about 40 years for Broadway to build up a head of steam that got it to where it was just before the pandemic. So anything new is not going to happen overnight. You know, they started with the, the trough of the 70s and started building up momentum, momentum so that became you know, billions of dollars being generated by Broadway shows that were running not five or six years, but decades, you know, 17 years for Les Mis, 25 years for Lion King. These, this was unheard of, grossing more than the top movies. So uh, it's going to take a little while, I think, to get back to that level. But certainly Broadway has been really, well, the, the, tr the trauma of having been shut off so quickly uh, when the pandemic hit, it was, it was amazing there. I mean, we were like in shock because it happened like five o'clock in the afternoon. We had an opening of a show the next night. We had another opening two days later. Everyone sent home. It stopped for over a year and a half. So it's been devastating on the industry. And we're, they're really ready to go forward uh, with new shows and, and some of the old ones. So as you know, Hades Town will be opening up soon. Uh, Springsteen's already on Broadway. So yeah, I think Broadway's going to come back. But it's not going to happen overnight. Yeah, and if you look, you know, I, I think that there was a couple of things that put into play. I mean, Stu's, uh, you know, uh, comment about, you know, it taking Broadway 40 years to really be the powerhouse that it is. Um, and that was recognized about five years ago that the National Endowment for the Arts and the National Bureau of Economics recognized arts and culture as an industry sector in the gross national uh, product. You know, so we were looking at this and saying, this is a business, this is an industry in the same way that other, you know, hotel industry, the airlines, it's, it's an economic driver. It's not just, oh, that's a lovely show and isn't that a great song? These are economic drivers. Um, and so Broadway has 41 theaters. The trillion dollar economy that is New York City is intertwined businesses and Broadway is a huge part of that. Broadway brought in with selling 14 million tickets in the last full season, the economic impact was close to $16 billion. So until those $16 billion and those 14 million tickets again are sold in New York City, the economy isn't going to be what it is. And with the uncertainty of the, you know, Delta variant coming of, you know, when other people can travel, when a tourist can travel to us, when we can travel to other places safely and come back. Those are all still uncertain, but the government has recognized the economic impact of these theaters, not just in New York, but the venues across the country. There's 200 touring Broadway theaters, and then there's regional theaters. So the shuttered venues operator grant that was approved by the government is $16 billion. Um, and that is to help those venues that do live performances to keep them going because they are economic drivers. So as I mentioned, New York City has 41 theaters. There's 200 of those across the country. Those are cultural hubs for those areas of the country. So, I mean, when you look at what the economies are around those theaters across the country, you know, they not only provide you know, jobs for within those communities. But when you look at urban areas that have large arts organizations, like these major theaters in them, you find that there's a higher rate of education. The, you know, people are more likely to graduate from high school. They're more likely to go on to college. They're more likely to vote. They're more likely to do community service and give back to that community, which makes it a much more cohesive community and cohesive communities are much safer, we're finding. So that's what these 
arts and culture hubs of these Broadway theaters and the touring theaters are across the country. And it was, you know, amazing that the government has actually recognized that, but that's not because you know, oh great, we all love to sing the songs. It's because these are economic drivers across the country. Yeah, it's a you major know? step that the uh, the government actually, for the first time in a major way, helpful way, has recognized the arts as a, as an economic force as well as a cultural step the, beyond the national endowment for the arts. Yes, and no question, Broadway drives New York City in many ways because when tourists come to New York. Besides going to sites of interest like the Statue of Liberty and maybe the Empire State Building and whatever sites they want to see, a Broadway show is high on the list of destinations to go to and very important. And then, of course, the whole Broadway community with all the hotels and all the restaurants around if there's no show, well, then all the hotels and the restaurants suffer too. And then of course, everyone employed by Broadway. And for our audience, we are with Bonnie Cumley and Stuart Lane. They are a married couple involved as Broadway producers. Both of them are Tony award-winning producers. They are philanthropists and they are the founders of Broadway HD. Now, this show is all about philanthropy, and I'd like to talk a little bit about your philanthropy. I know you're involved with a number of different charities. I'm going to leave it up to you, Bonnie and Stuart, to start by speaking about some of the charities that are of most interest to you or, or the things where you feel you've made the most impact. Oh, well, this has been a, many years of work in different organizations. <laughs> That's my, my mask I'm wearing to the theater when I go back in September for the Drama League. I was just elected as board president for the Drama League in, uh, in June. So that's something that's very close to me. Um, sorry, I cut off, Stu. I was so excited yeah, about so my I mask. was all about to put my plug in for the Actors Fund of America. Uh, I've been on the board, of, uh, the board of directors there for several years, and now I'm on the uh, Actors Fund uh, housing committee for them. Uh, so I've been a big contributor and supporter of the Actors Fund, which of course has been enormously important during these hard times in the pandemic, when there's been no safety net for the performers, the actors, the writers, the directors, the uh, people who work within the industry that the Actors Fund affects. They, they support everybody in, in, the, in the industry, from ticket takers to, Purdue, to, uh, to the uh, actors, to the musicians uh, there. So that's been one major thing. Uh, the other supporter I've been very big with is my alma mater, Boston University. So I've been a big supporter of Boston University and several other colleges with Bonnie up in the Massachusetts area, Emerson, uh, as well as uh, University of Massachusetts. So we're big, big on supporting that. Uh, Columbia University, we set up a, a scholarship fund there for the uh, business school. So there's a lot of different philanthropic uh, events that we've been to and that we support. Yes, and I think there's a theater at one of the universities up in Massachusetts named after both of you. Am I correct in stating that? Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah at uh, Boston University and at uh, UMass, there are theaters named after us. And at Emerson, where the um, Musical Theater Society um, is named yes, after us. Yes, and uh, generally a theater is not named after an individual or a couple unless they've been very generous and a very giving uh, to that theater, correct? Yes, yes. And, and we're yes. Very checks active were written. Yes. Checks were written, but we also yeah. feel that you know these were places that were very important to us, very important to our career. We don't feel that we would be where we are without those particular yes. organizations, uh, specifically without Emerson College, Boston University, and uh, UMass. Um, so, you know, we're like our start. Yes, and what you're really saying is that you. You went to schools, you, you received a lot from these institutions, and now that you've become very successful, you've decided that it's very important to give back to them. And that's true philanthropy, to give where there is a need and also where your passions lie. And because you feel in, in, indebted or maybe just grateful to these different institutions for what they gave you, you've decided to give back to them. And I really have to commend that. That's really wonderful. And as we look forward into 2021, the fall, and then 
moving into 2022, what's going to happen to Broadway? You mentioned that you think things will be a little slower because I guess there's a little bit of a fear of right now with the new Delta strain of, of going into theaters, but hopefully this will all end. What are your thoughts long-term? Long-term, there'll always be a Broadway. And in fact, because of what's been happening culturally, uh, the uh, idea of being uh, co you know, inclusive and diversified is going to expand the creative juices of Broadway. So I think you're going to see a lot more varied product. You're going to see a lot more family-oriented product and a lot of more products reflect the life that we live today. So only big improvements on that part. Getting the audiences more comfortable and coming back might take a little longer. I know that uh, after 9-11, advanced sales that used to be six or nine months in ahead kind of shrunk to like four weeks ahead. So people might not be planning as far ahead as they might, but they're certainly going to come back to live theater. I think from an audience perspective, you know, the shows will go on. The shows are, are all opening, as we said. Uh, there's two shows that are already open. Uh, Springsteen on Broadway, Passover just opened last week. Um, Moulin Rouge is opening. Hades Town is opening. Lion King, Wicked, Hamilton. You know, these shows are all opening. And, you know, there might be an opportunity for you to see a show that you weren't able to get tickets for before, you know, and on a Saturday night, um, you know, so that's sort of the, the opportunity that's there for those of us that live in the tri-state area, um, because there, there aren't the tourists coming to town just yet um, in the same numbers that they were. But I think that, you know, the Broadway community has committed to uh, the highest public safety standards so that everything is going to, you know, look the same, you know, you're going to go in, you have to, until at least the end of October, you will have to uh, prove that you have been vaccinated, you'll have to wear a mask within the theater. Um, so those things are in place, you can be confident that the actors and all of the creatives backstage, because when you see a, a show, you see 25 people on stage, but there's another 75 of them behind the scenes that are supporting that show, and they're all safe. The, uh, all of the 13 Broadway unions you know, surprisingly, all came together just about a month ago to say, these are the things that we are asking. These are the things that we're requiring that we feel are, you know, needed in order for our community, our union members to feel safe to go to work. And they all agree, which is amazing, um, in such a short period of time for these people that have different needs sometimes to uh, be able to come together so quickly and all agree on vaccines and on masks. And then they, you know, again, once we get to November, that will be uh, reevaluated to see if that's going to be any different. But for the audience, I think it will be the same experience. Some of the shows are going to be um, condensed. They're going to be a little bit shorter. Some of them are looking at eliminating the uh, intermissions. Um, the, uh, you know, some of them are actually, uh, you know, look, you know, in, in, in getting the and apps, uh, you know, so that you can prove that you're vaccinated before you get to the theater, the sort of choreography and how people will be uh, working backstage to move through quick changes will be different, but that's not anything that the audience is going to see. The lines to restrooms will be very carefully monitored. There's okay. new positions that are being uh, formed and created right now. Uh, these are COVID safety deputies that are going to be assigned to all the theaters to make sure that all the employees there are safe. So there's a lot of precautions and Broadway has committed to the utmost in uh, public safety they're, they're, standards. They're, they're actually condensing some of the shows. Uh, there, there were two huge productions of the uh, Harry Potter Cursed Child, part one and part two. They're actually combining two different productions into one tight production for that reason. All very interesting. And with tens of thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people who love Broadway, I have to believe it's going to come back stronger than ever because when people can't do something for a while, well, they want to do it more than ever. They want to go out to Broadway. And if it takes a little time, well, that's part of the game for everyone's safety right now and security. But Broadway, in my opinion, is definitely coming back. Now, we just have a few minutes left. And I want uh, Stu and Bonnie for you to give a little advice to some of the younger people watching this show who might want to get involved as Broadway producers, as Broadway directors, what advice do you give to them? 
Well, this is an opportunity and time that the industry has been growing like mad. Certainly with the, with the internet and streaming, uh, New York has become a hub. You don't have to be bi-coastal anymore. You didn't have to do movies and TV in California and only commercials and soap operas here in New York and Broadway. You can actually stay here and do all of that, plus the internet and streaming. And organizations like the Drama League that Bonnie's president of uh, encourage young directors and are actually a breeding ground for young, active, successful directors on Broadway. So there are organizations like that uh, and if you want to get involved with philanthropy, the Actors Fund of America is a terrific organization, really a safety net to everyone in the industry. So there's room for everybody. And I like hearing that because philanthropy is about giving time, knowledge, and then available resources. And when Broadway opens up its doors and wants new people involved, well, that's part of philanthropy too. We have about another minute left. I wanna just mention something to the audience. Bonnie Comley and Stuart Lane on November 12th will be honored by the French Heritage Society. I serve on that board. We're very excited to honor them for all of their good work. And if you can, you go on that website and buy a ticket to support the wonderful work of the French Heritage Society and then to show your support of Bonnie Cumley and Stuart Lane. This concludes Successful Philanthropy. Our guests today, Bonnie Cumley and Stuart Lane, they are a married couple who are both Broadway producers, directors, and the founders of Broadway HD. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm Jean Shafferoff, your host. I'll see you next week. Thank you, Jean. Thank you.